Hi, how are you? I'm Melissa. I'm Clay Kane, I'm the host. Nice to meet you. We've got until 12.50, so we've got 20 minutes. Great. I hear some water for you. Oh, this is for me. I was like, somebody left this. Is it okay if I sit here? Thank you. Um, you can just use um, Lauren Hill. No, Wait, oh. I need to get Candy's attention. No, I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, have that one ready after. Oh, Carlton, yeah. get her attention. Well, I'll, I'll call her. I'll text her. Bye, boo. Okay. All right. How's your day? Uh, great day. <laughs> Although I have to leave early because of this hurricane. Oh, my gosh. South Carolina. I text her. I don't know if she has her phone now. Do you, oh, oh, do you want to put the headphones I on? I do. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> I know sometimes with the hair, right? We just had uh, Miss Nina Franklin here, Miss America. Oh, I know, everybody's saying how lovely she is. She is, she is. I have one minute. Mm -hmm. What's your Twitter? Uh, Clay Kane, C L A Y C A N E. I think yeah, we, we tweeted you, right? We tweeted, right? Yeah, we, we copied you. I'm sure you have a lot of notifications. So. Thirty seconds. That's 866-801-8255. Welcome back to the Clay Kane Show. In 1998, Lauryn Hill's Miss Education of Lauryn Hill was the number one album in the country 20 years ago this week. I just got a shout out X Factor. I love the song. I wanted to play it. Well, listen, I'm very excited for our guest who's here in the studio, former White House aide, Author of Unhinged, New York Times bestseller, Omarosa Manigault Newman. How are you? Yeah, I'm so glad to be here, Clay. Thank you for being here. So, congrats on your third book. This is your third book, yes. New York Times bestseller. Thank you. So, in Unhinged, you talk about your journey. You talk about growing up in the projects, experiencing gun violence. You went to three HBCUs, right? Oh, three three HBCUs. HBCUs. Yes, yes. So, you're clearly a smart woman. So. I guess I'm confused. How does someone as, as smart as you get blindsided by, by someone like Trump? Well, that would, that would, first of all, I'm glad to be here. That would assume that also the 28 million people who tuned in to us on The Apprentice were also blindsided. You know, I wasn't the only one in, the Amer in America who that, that Donald Trump was a successful businessman who was running an amazing company and who was a very interesting person, as we saw on The Apprentice. Um, I was duped, but I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. But you knew him personally, so yeah, I guess... I've known him for 15 years now. Okay. So let me ask you this. You know, when we think about policy, right? When we think about policy, you talked about uh, the uh, Trump campaign. Give me one piece of policy that Trump had for the black community in 2016 that made you feel like at the time he would be good for our community. Well, that's the benefit of being at the table. Uh, you know, right now they're making decisions about us without us. But at the time when I was on the campaign, I was able to help formulate the plan, the 10 step plan for black America. The first thing that we wanted to focus on was economic success. We knew that tax reform was going to be a big part of the administration's agenda and the 20% tax rate and the impact of that on small businesses. And so the first thing I did within the first couple of weeks was to go over and establish a, a powerful working relationship with the SBA to make sure that small businesses, particularly minority-owned businesses, were able to take advantage of the tax cuts, but also to help 
develop the reform that we were going to see. The second thing we talked about was education, which of course is uh, near and dear to my heart. People focus on my work in the HBCU stuff, but in addition to the HBCU funding of getting year-round Pell Grants, I wanted to make sure that there were some infrastructure discussions. Um, have you been to many of the campuses at HBCU? Of course. <laughs> um, a lot of them experiencing infrastructure issues, buildings that are deteriorating. Uh, piping roads. All what of was the policy from him to, to run the campaign? Well, I developed, I, I developed those. That's so, what I'm going through. Because I never he heard was, him. He wasn't smart enough to. to he wasn't this. saying that. You have uh, the way it works is that you have policy advisors who actually outline those things. No, the, the campaign announced his agenda for Black America, the ten step plan. Um, he, they officially announced that after he got his nomination. So no, that was that was an official position that was put out. Because when I think about his policy for black folks, I heard you're living in hell. You know, why not, you know, give no, it a chance? No, you heard his hyperbole. Behind that was a person who grew up in the black community, black churches, black schools, all that, formulating those policies. Okay. So, no, Donald Trump wouldn't sit down and come up with policy positions. That's why, you know, policy advisors are so important. And when you talk about being blindsided. But wait, but, but I, wanna, I just want to give you a couple of okay, sure. um, that's very important to me. Um, the issues of what was happening in Flint um, with the water. There are probably 20 or 30 big cities that also have very similar issues to what Flint has in terms of the contamination of water. So I didn't want to just focus on Flint, although we did. I wanted to um, have a report that was done on the conditions in inner cities of water um, purification system, infrastructure and pamping, uh, piping and all of that. So it was, I wasn't just focused on on Flint. But I, I, I felt like Flint. when you were out there, and if I'm wrong, if we out there on the campaign trail, I wasn't hearing that. It just felt so divisive. It oh, just well, felt because you don't get to go out and say, look what Omarosa's doing. Mm -hmm. You go and say, the Trump campaign is doing this and the Trump campaign is doing that. I didn't get to go out there and you know toot my own horn of what I was doing. But the other thing is people weren't trying to hear it. They immediately shut me down because I was standing next to Donald Trump. Um, the pushback that I got was deafening. Nobody was giving me an opportunity to come sit down with him and talk about the issues that I'm sharing with you. That was That's why it was so important for me to write my book, to talk about my journey and the things that I did and how I did it. Because when you work for the President of the United States, you say the President did X, Y, Z. You don't get to take credit for the work that you did. And when you work for a candidate, it's the same thing. So when you talk about being blindsided, I, this is an important question to me. You campaign with Diamond and Silk. And I truly think they're no, they dangerous. They campaign with me. They campaign with you. Yeah. God, let's make clear. I think they are really dangerous propaganda. What was your impression working for them? Are they sincere, or are they just trying to get attention and make money? I thought they were nice girls. I mean, I'm never going to knock anybody's hustle. And so if that's their hustle and they want to make money, why knock them? But do you think it was sincere? Because pe people feel like it's a joke, it's a gimmick. No, I mean, it was sincere to them, but I'm never going to uh, knock another sister's hustle. That's not my position. Okay, all right. Uh, you were on. The, um, April Ryan was on the Karen Hunter show, and you, and you mentioned we well, talks about you in her book, and she says that that you you tried to she tried to kill my career, a divorced single mother with kids, that you made up a lie, that she received money from the Clinton campaign, and you tried to get her fired. Is that true? Uh, I didn't. You know, the emails came out that showed that she was um, in conversation about being paid by the Clinton campaign. I didn't come out with that. That came out in the emails with the WikiLeaks. Facts, so you, like so, facts. But so you didn't try but to get. I, I sent an email to her privately and said, "Look at what came out on WikiLeaks. Protect yourself." That's what she's talking about. So let's go to the facts. Okay. And um, she, she's the one that put that out there. She put that private exchange out into the, the public space. But I don't have a beef with her. I wish her well. I mean, you know, I, I heard she has a project out. I haven't seen much about it. I mean, God bless her. Hopefully, people will read it. So you weren't trying to get her fired. At any point, you can't. That's so ignorant. That's like, what she said. That's what she that, said. But you can't. She she is the White House correspondent for a news organization. How would so? I mean, it's just so. I, I don't even know how to respond to such. You know, the perception of ignorance that you only her company would deem whether or not she's doing her job or not. Not me. I mean, it's. I'm surprising she gives me that much power in her life, but I didn't have that power. Nor was she, was she even on my radar at all. I like her, so I hope that you know people will you know find some benefit in the stuff that she's saying. But I think if you look at our two projects, our books came out around the same time. I'm number one on the bestsellers list. 
Yeah. That's a very she's, Trump she's, line. That's a very no, no, Trump no, line. No, 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 but you, you brought her up, so it's fair. Yeah, yeah. You, you brought it up because you wanted me to get feedback. And I'm not being shady. I'm number one on New York Times bestseller list. At, I don't know where she is, but, you know, people respond to truth in different ways. You talk about the, the bow down moment in Unhinged, and I was speaking to a friend of mine. He said, I will never be able to forgive Omarosa for saying bow down, that it was a very Hitler-esque Putin kind of comment. Wow. Do, do, do you regret think, telling the American people that they should that they will bow down to Trump? Oh, I express that in my book, my regrets for that. But political hyperbole is consistent with that. I mean, maybe he's just never been around politics, but political hyperbole. The bow down was intense, Omarosa. No, but you've been, have you been around politics? I have been around politics. That is the but, mo not but, the most dramatic. Let me tell you but what. But bow what, down is very dictator. It's, it's very dictatorship. Fair enough. Yeah, so, so, I'll, so I'll accept that, but let's just not act like that's the first time you heard something hyper, hyper dramatic in politics. Yeah, but you said it, and you were there as a and black woman supporting full, supporting black Americans. And I take full responsibility for that, but I'm not going to be, you know, chastised because I was no, doing what, poli what politicians do. You know, what I think is hy hyperbolic is saying that blacks are um, super predators. You know, well, I, I critiqued Hillary Clinton, to, absolutely. So, yeah. so let's acknowledge that that's But we're talking hyperbolic. about you, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, but everything that I say, I support with facts. I don't just pull it out of the air. Okay. Politics is a rough game. If you can't deal with it, don't step in the arena. Let me ask you this. On Joe Madison's show right here on Urban View, we love Uncle mm -hmm. Joe, uh, you said that Trump hit on you. What exactly did he do? What exactly did, did he say? What was um, the inappropriate thing he said? It's not uncommon um, for... For me to have been on the receiving end and other women in the Trump universe, for Donald Trump is very physical. He grabs you, he'll walk up, he'll kiss you, he'll do whatever. That's what Donald Trump does. Before the Me Too movement, I know it sounds naive, but I didn't know that, though, I mean, I've seen women that come forward and say, my boss kissed me on the cheek, you know, hashtag Me Too. I'm like, well, shoot, I'm the Me Too victim, too. Because but what, what did he do to you? What did he I say to you? I just said that. He grabbed, he, he grabbed you. you. And he will grab you and say, hey, yeah, and kiss you. Did he say anything I, specific to you? I was just saying. Okay. <laughs> well, well, you didn't say what he said, so I was wondering what he said specifically um, that he was hitting on you. Well, he physically will grab you, kiss okay. you, up, whether you w welcome it or not. Mm -hmm. And not many of us welcomed it. I certainly didn't. Maybe Hope did, maybe others, but I didn't. Uh, you said that you heard the tape of uh, Donald Trump using the N-word. Yes. In what context did he use it? What was the sentence with which he used it? Who did he say it about? Um, great question. So back in 2016, and I write about this, because uh, it was a, a turning point for me in my relationship with Donald Trump. A producer from The Apprentice sent out a tweet that said, if you think the Access Hollywood tape is bad, wait until you hear The Apprentice tapes. And then he went, go, went on to do an interview with NPR, and he said that Donald Trump had said the N-word, he had um, insulted Jews, this, that, and the other. This is two weeks before the election, and as I said, I'd known that man for 13 years. By that point, it planted a seed of doubt and concern for me. We go on to win the election, but the talk about the N-word tape did not die. Um, other people started coming forward. In fact, recently, uh, Penn Jillette came forward and said, forget the tape. I was in the room when Donald Trump said these things. And so after I, I did Big Brother, I started working on the book, after um, I had a chance to go out in L.A., and the person that has the tape reached out to me and allowed me to hear it for myself. And it was in the context, um, as the producer said, very consistent, with Donald Trump um, off takes. These were outtakes from The Apprentice um, talking and communicating off the cuff. And yes, he used that word. But to who was he talking about? Well, he, he, I've been clear. He's been, he was talking in one instance about Kwame, but there were other instances. Um, that so he was talking about Apprentice cast members? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the book, you repeatedly say that part of the reason why you stayed, because the big question is, why did she stay? They say, you said that you wanted to be a voice for, for African Americans, someone to be at the table. But when I, when I read that in the book, I, it reminded me what the black pastors were saying, that be at the table. But then I think of Which folks, black the black pastors, John Gray, uh, Alveda oh, King, who's a faith Ray. leader, yes, who oh, were okay. at the table. And they said, we have to be at the table. But then I think of someone like LeBron James or DeRay McKesson, they will not meet with Trump. What's the point of sitting with the oppressor? I mean, you, you, you can't stop Massa from being racist. So what's the point of sitting with the oppressor if, he, if he's not going to hear you? If every black person quit their job or walked away from a situation because they encountered some form of racism in America, half of us wouldn't be employed and half of us would just stay home. Um, it's naive to think that we 
need to all be in the Democratic Party. Of course. I mean, I think it's very dangerous to assert that no one should be there advising Donald Trump on black issues, which was uh, an, a thing that was said to me over and over again. They are making decisions about us without us. And that's harmful to our community. Um, the people who believe that no one should be in there, there should be no black advisors, don't understand that the policies that are being made right now have implications for 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Remaking of the tax code hasn't happened in, what, 30 years? These are implications that our community will feel for a very long time. We need to have someone there. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, point blank, period. But you're sitting with the oppressor, though. I mean, you could still do the I work. I sit with the oppressor a lot. But, you but, you, but do you understand why someone America, like LeBron James? I want LeBron to respond James? To you. Go ahead, go ahead. Corporate America is filled with people who oppress but, us. But we're talking about the you president of the United Syria. States. But, babe, you work for Syria. We're talking XM. about the president of the United States, though. The president, not, not just but the But these are, let's, let's, let's break this down. These are systems that in their DNA did not want us. Let's not be naive about not understanding what our history is. Of course. Is. We just integrated. Um, major institutions in the 70s, my friend. So it's not just politics, it's business, it's education. Some of our institutions, some of our educational institutions didn't allow African Americans to enroll. So to say you're sitting with the oppressor, I can point out a whole lot of but we're talking and they might be in serious XM. But we're talking we're about for a white organization too. We're, we're talking about the president of the United States, who you defended. You keep okay. saying that, but what's the point? What, okay. What's your point? Here, here, your point. Here, here's my point, Omarosa. Okay. I don't believe you. I don't believe that you went in there saying you were going to help, thinking you were going to help black people. I believe that you knew he was a con artist, and I believe you're a con artist as well, and I believe that you were being an opportunist. So, and I'm speaking for a lot of African Americans who you're call not in. Speaking. You're speaking. For I said yourself. a lot. I said a lot. You're I said a lot. No, I'm not. No, the, the majority of black really, women, 96 percent. I'm just telling you me. that's fine. But I'm telling you that it's it appears it appears you're you were ignorant. an opportunist. You're did, did you just want the check? Oh, you're but calling you're me ignorant. ignorant? Yeah. You're, yeah. I'm 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 ignorant. I'm ignorant. But you were sitting with an ignorant racist man for a year. Yeah, but you're ignorant. And he was your friend for 15 years. You have an agenda. You want to have a moment. No, that's cute. But let me respond. I'm asking you fair questions. Sure, go ahead. So whether you believe me or not, my life is my life. Sure. God is the author and finisher of my faith. As so mine. your insults don't have any impact on me. God brought me from the projects of Youngstown to sit not with one but two presidents. So whether you believe me or not, that's not going to impact my future because you don't have any impact on my life. You asked what my point was. Because you're, was you're as problematic as, as Sarah, as Sarah Huckabee Sanders. How am I being disrespectful? You want to appeal speaking, to clicks, I'm, which I'm, are I'm, cheap. Amorosa, Amorosa, you've it's been cheap. on reality shows. Have, you, you've done I'm everything you've done. You want clicks. You want fame.